Hello, my name is Simon Double and welcome to Inside the Rails, a monthly podcast for horse racing enthusiasts everywhere. And as ever, I'm joined by my co-host, Phil Boyle from BG Racing. Hi, Phil. How are you doing? Hi, Simon. All good, thanks. Although, yeah, perhaps a little bit jaded. We're recording this on Wednesday, the 22nd of November, and uh, I was at Market Brazen where Dynamic Cape ran last Thursday, then straight over to the Cotswolds for Friday, Saturday and Sunday racing at Cheltenham. I arrived home on Monday lunchtime, was straight back in the same direction yesterday to see Dynamic Cape run again, this time at Hereford, and back for a snooker match yesterday evening. So too many late nights and too many early mornings for me. Tell you what, I bet you're glad you've got that new super duper car you recently purchased because it sounds like you've really clocked up some miles during the last week. <laughs> anyway, we'll discuss how Dynamic Kate and the BG Racing Horses have fared in a minute, along with the Cheltenham November meeting. However, it's really good to get our second jockey in two months as a guest later on, and that will be apprentice Frederick Larson, known as Freddie. And uh, he wrote a winner for me last year. Indeed, he did. And your pocketbook of jockey contacts must be uh, it's certainly getting a good bashing. It must be nearly empty. Do you, do you jockeys know that when they ride a Solario rating runner, it's contingent on them also agreeing to be a podcast guest on Inside the Rails? Oh, yes, that's the <laughs> deal. That's the deal. No, not really. The big issue of the day in racing, it's still affordability checks and betting. And that's bookmakers actually checking whether the likes of you and me can afford to bet. Uh, there's a petition going on at the moment, and we're up to 90,000 signatures on this petition. And we need, or the industry needs, 100,000 for the issue to be debated in Parliament. We should get there, but it's not been easy. A touch of apathy rules okay in some racing quarters, I fear. What do you think, Phil? Yeah, I have to say I've been pretty disappointed with the performance of that petition. Okay, so the numbers that have signed are pretty big. But yeah, if you look at them in the wider context of people who work in racing or are racing fans, the numbers are just not high enough. If anyone is listening to this and has not yet signed the petition, then I'd want to ask you why not? You can't go thinking it won't affect you. If you bet on racing, it could impact on you significantly in terms of inconveniencing you. Uh, and even if you don't bet, it's something that threatens the future of racing as a sport. So surely that's something people can spare a couple of minutes to help fight against. And again, Phil, this issue is about freedom of choice. So please, 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 if you haven't signed this petition, do. Now, Dynamic Kate's been a busy girl for BG Racing with mixed fortunes of late, Phil. Yes, indeed. She ran at Market Raisin on the 16th of November, but she was well beaten there. I know listeners will be well used to you getting frustrated by ground conditions, but this one <laughs> is probably my turn. Yeah, we chose this race as Kate just doesn't handle soft ground, and it looked there that we were going to get much better conditions two days before the meeting. The ground was advertised as good to soft, good in places, and with only a little bit of rain between then and the race day, it was described as good to soft on the day, but I mean, it just wasn't. Race times would suggest it was much softer than that, much, much softer. Uh, and Kate just didn't handle it at all. It was, a, it was a waste of a run, a waste of travel time, a waste of expense. And, yeah, all of those things are really precious to us with her due to retire soon for breeding. Ah, our dear old friend, Accurate Going Reports. There we go. Anyway, the mayor did run much better on the 21st of November at Hereford when she had good, well, this is the official going, good ground, good to firm in places. Wow. And I thought, I watched the race. She travelled much better and was fourth. Um, so, so so, well done there, Phil. What about your other horses? Um, yeah, yeah, we were much happier with the run at Hereford yesterday. And you're right, the ground was much better there. You could hear them rattling off it. It was a much more fitting sign off for her. We've had We've had great fun with her over the years. Not much to report on the other two, really, to be honest. Bella Cavallo is is really pleasing Neil Mulholland at home. She should be racing in mid-December. Um, and Strider's had a successful breathing operation, and he's coming back to fitness now, and he'll be back on the race course about the same sort of time. So hopefully a little bit to report next month. Now, you've heard about the BG Racing Runners, but we told listeners last month that you would have had a run from sharp distinction between when we recorded and when we released the podcast here's your opportunity to tell us how that went he won 
Yes, he won for the second time this year. And it was his first run back after a wind up, which was a minor procedure to help his breathing. And he won in fine style, showing a really good turn of foot under an excellent ride from a jockey I've admired for a while, Adam Farragher, who's attached to the Willie Haggis yard. Um, as I said, that was his second win this year. And then last week, he went to Chelmsford, where he was reopposing the runner-up Aquam on five pounds worse terms for beating him two lengths at Lingfield. Mathematically, I really couldn't see us beating him this time around. And sadly, my maths was in good order because we were beaten. But we were four lengths ahead of the third horse. Interestingly, Aquam has won again since, so franking the form. And the handicapper has put us up another pound. So we're now on a career high of 77. And Sharp Distinction has an intended target back at Lingfield on the 5th of December, um, over just under two miles. So on that occasion, uh, that will be after we've published the podcast. Great stuff. And it was great to see him having some success. Yeah, really pleased for you. Uh, and I look forward to, uh, since you've spoken so glowingly about Adam Farragher, he'll be no doubt appearing on Inside the Rail soon. So look forward <laughs> to that. What, <laughs> what about the rest of your horses? I saw Taratino was sold at the Tattersall's Horses in Training Sales. But yeah, I saw that Dancing in the Woods was withdrawn from there. Did you decide to keep him or was he sold privately? Okay, let's deal with Tarantino first. He's been sold and he's been sold to go hurdling. In fact, I notice he's entered at Exeter this week. That's an interesting move as I don't think he'll get two miles in a horse box. (laughs) And I certainly wouldn't want to be riding him in a hurdle race. Uh, I'm sure he probably doesn't want me on his back either, but never mind. Um, (laughs) Look, having said that, his issue was particularly with the stalls. So maybe a standing start um, without the stalls will help him. We shall see in due course. Incidentally, listeners, for those of you who are fans of Gary the Goat, who was bought by Amy to um, calm Tarantino down, he wasn't sold and he has a new companion at Amy Murphy's. In, In fact, on that note, he went missing, actually, a while ago. And Amy said to the staff, oh, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic, you'll turn up somewhere. And she said, just go and have a look around the boxes. And he'd actually wandered into a box. And uh, the horse that he was with, that's now the companion. So there you go. <laughs> anyway, Dancing in the Woods, a nice story about him finishing his racing career. He was withdrawn from the sales, as you rightly pointed out, Phil. Um, he was withdrawn with a vet certificate. Um, he'd been recovering from a leg infection, nothing too serious. Um, but he was sold privately to the lad Luke Bacon, who used to work in racing, and he used to ride him as a two-year-old at Dean Ivory's, and he's now set up a livery yard, and he's gone to him. So good old Woody will have a great new life, either team chasing, showing, or maybe eventing. That's good to hear. Nice to see these race horses getting another chance in their retirement. So, yeah, look forward to seeing what he can uh, do in his new sphere. So what about the two new yearlings how are they doing how are you getting on with the share sales yes they've been fully broken in and ridden away and i'm delighted to say it all went very well now those are they just interrupt you there those are two terms that we probably ought to explain to people because i don't think either of them really means what they sound broken in and ridden away let's let's tell the listeners about those two terms actually that's a good point phil we all get very used don't we to using jargon and we take it for granted so the term fully broken in doesn't really it doesn't. It doesn't come across as what how it sounds like. You're not breaking in a horse at all. You're actually building it up in, with confidence. Um, I think the term goes back maybe to the Wild West when you were being a bit harsh on, you know, breaking in a horse, put, putting a saddle on the horse and riding it. it it's actually about taking a, a race horse and actually getting uh, to the stage where you've got a rider on its back, and it's a very gradual process. Uh, but it's a lovely process to to watch, and I was very privileged to watch it, uh, not for the first time recently. The term ridden away, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? I remember many years ago an owner said to me, ridden away, what, what do you mean, that my horse has gone? Uh, no, it's just ridden away means basically that's when a person has sat on its back and, and it's ridden sort of for, for the first time. So a uh, bit of a long explanation for a very short question, Phil. <laughs> I have to say, watching Amy's husband and assistant trainer, Lemos D'Souza, and a team riding the horses on the gallops and in an open field was truly inspiring and educational. I've been in racing 29 years, and you still never stop learning about these things. Um, Lemos is Brazilian, and he was telling me that it's all about instilling confidence in these youngsters. So 
I had the privilege of seeing the massile colt being ridden in an open field at walk, trot, and yes, canter, only a day after he was first sat on. And the Mahatha colt was ridden out on his own one day with no lead horse. Truly amazing. As for the shares, yes, they're selling nicely. In fact, the Massar Colt is already half sold, so I'm really pleased about that. And still on the subject of young horses, I'm going to my first foal sale at Tattersalls quite soon, which I'm very excited about. Indeed, that sounds interesting, and uh, I hope it proves to be an enjoyable experience, and hopefully not to an expensive one. Well, who knows? Who knows? There's a particular <laughs> foal. I won't say too much now, but there's a particular foal I've got my eye on. So we'll see. We'll see. Now, this month's racing. Well, let's start with the Breeders' Cup held over two days at Santa Anita, where 14 world champions were crowned. The Brits and the Irish did well again on the turf, winning five of the seven group ones over the two days. Big Evs won for Trainer McAppleby. Unquestionable and August Roda, one for the O'Brien, Ballydoyle, Ryan Moore connections. In Spiral was another group one for the Gosdens and Frankie de Tory. And Godolphin had the one two with Master of the Seas and Morge in a Breeders' Cup mile. There were some inspirational rides, I thought, from the British jockeys, proving yet again on the turf we have some of the greatest jockeys in the world. Did you watch any of it, Phil? Um, I certainly did. I watched both days. Um, it was great to see Big Evs kick off things for the British runners with a win. And it was brilliant to see a smaller t- stable having international success. Um, if anybody hasn't seen the Twitter video of the Mick Appleby staff watching the race, uh, you should really seek that out. It was great to yeah. see how much yeah. these successes mean. It's well worth looking for. Uh, it really is sort of great to see that kind of joy as as their horse got up to win the race. Um, it was a shame that Living the Dream didn't repeat that success with a win in the sprint, but he led for long enough to get everyone excited. And again, it's another group of connections that wouldn't be used to racing at that level. And it seemed like they had a, a really special trip to the US for the meeting. Yes. Not only did yours truly have a profitable two days at the Breeders' Cup, but it was great to see proper, fast racing ground. It was firm, but perfectly safe. Now, I didn't see much of the November meeting at Cheltenham due to other commitments, but uh, I'm sure you'd have been there. How was it for you, as they say? I certainly was there. It was a it was a good meeting. Perhaps it might not have been packed with superstar performances, but uh, I guess time will tell on that one. I might be wrong. Uh, the big race was won by Stage Star, a syndicate-owned horse which was great to see. Despite a last fence blunder, uh, he held on to win. Um, and he's a grade one horse. He won at the Cheltenham Festival last year. And there was also the real whacker in the same race, both grade one winners. And it's brilliant to see those top class horses not being afraid to run in handicap. So I hope more horses do that in the future rather than sticking to the level weights races because it, it does provide an interesting dynamic as to whether they can overcome top weight against them some uh, slightly lesser rated but still sort of up-and-coming opposition. I thought Burdett Road, who won the juvenile hurdle, was probably the most impressive performance of the weekend, Um, certainly my highlight, and I I hope he proves to be top class. I know many people will have ranked John Bond's win as as their highlight of the meeting. He was certainly impressive. But, uh, yeah, I felt all three of his rivals had question marks coming into the race, so just couldn't be certain just how good he was when he won that race. Not sure exactly how well all the others ran. We shall see, I suppose, as time goes on. Um, And of course, the inside the rails highlight came in the very last race on Sunday, the last race of the three days. So last month's guest, Jack Quinlan, had just ridden his first Cheltenham winner when he recorded with us last month. And um, he had his second winner in the final race of the November meeting when Breakin Castle won the bumper. And Jack gave us some horses to follow last month. And Breaking Castle, I think, was the first one he mentioned. So I was very happy to cheer him home on that one. Yes, well done, Jack, for giving listeners a steer on Breaking Castle. Well, it's that time of the podcast when we have our guest, and I'm delighted to say apprentice jockey Frederick Larson is on the line. Hi, Freddie. How are you? Yeah, all good. Thanks very much for having me, guys. Pleasure to be here. Well, it's uh, very kind of you to come on. Um, I think you've got a rare day without a, a ride today. Is that right? Yeah, just this time coming up to Christmas, it's always pretty quiet. So, um, no, great to have a spare day and 
No, it's good to good to speak to you guys. Well, th- thanks, as I said, for coming on. Your very first ride for Solario Racing was on Dancing in the Woods in October last year. I couldn't be there, unfortunately, as I was at the Earling Sales, uh, but I was watching it with Amy. Tell us about the riding instructions from Amy Murphy and how did the race pan out? Listen, um, <laughs> Dancing in the Woods, he always, always, in his whole life, he's always been dropped out and... Uh, and Amy said to me, listen, this apprentice race, they'll probably end up going fairly sharp, should suit him. Um, and what did you and what did you do? Well, I'm I <laughs> I'm pretty <laughs> sure I'm pretty sure it was first start after another wind up, was it? I'm pretty sure. He jumped out and I could I looked across and there was three lads on the inside of me looking across, thinking, who's gonna go and make the running? And I thought if I take back, we'll end up crawling round because no one wanted to make it. So I thought well, we're not going to win from behind, so might as well give it a go from the front. And he actually dug it out really, really well. And for the benefit of listeners, he did win. Um, funny enough, <laughs> he did funny, win, enough yeah. funny enough, <laughs> listeners, just before we were doing the sound check, I was talking to Freddie um, about jockeys and sort of doing the unusual and maybe ignoring instructions. And, and he agreed that uh, if you make a bold move and it works, you're the Best things in sliced bread, and if of course it doesn't work, you get called all the names under the sun. Um, but on that occasion, I know you've joked about it since. You know, you you have to you have to think on your feet, don't you? And if the race, if the pace of the race isn't right, you've got to, you've got to react, and you did, and and won. So, uh, thank you for ignoring Amy's instructions. That was good. <laughs> um, now, look, talk, talk, talking of first, you went on your very first ride in public. Tell the listeners a bit more about that. When was it? And and, and tell us about that. Yeah, so um, probably coming up to three years ago now, um, in the middle of December, I just got my license and I've been riding this horse every morning um, since I'd been at Mix and Thrave. And Mick said, you're going to have your first ride in him on whatever day it was. And I was delighted, nervous, but delighted. And um, walked the course before Ali Rawlinson, give me a load of help and it was just like a blur. That's what I can remember. It, I felt like I was in a film and I was looking up at the, I was looking out through the stalls, up at the floodlights and it was all over in a flash. Um, and luckily, um, more by luck than judgment, I'm pretty sure. But listen, he got up right at the line um, and, you know, you can't ask for a better start than that. So no, I was delighted. No, you're, being, you're being too modest. It looked a pretty good first ride to me. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure connections were very, very pleased. Now, Look, let's just go back to the beginning. How did you get into racing? What's the Freddie Larson story? I think you actually started off wanting to be a professional footballer, didn't you? Yeah, ever since I could walk, um, I played football. And things like doors opened for me when I was when I was very young. I was playing for the county. Then clubs kind of cut, um, started sniffing around me then, probably at about 14, 15 First, I was on trial at West Ham and then Crystal Palace in the end. Um, that was the last professional club I was at. Listen, it didn't really work out. Um, I got dropped from from Crystal Palace and I tried to go into, you know, semi-professional. But as a five foot three, 18, 19 year old kid at the time, trying to go into, you know, fairly competitive men's football. Um, with seasoned pros in there at that level it was just hard for me to break in but yeah I think I just kind of got disillusioned with it because obviously stepping up into the men's game I wasn't getting the playing time I would have been getting at academy youth level and I just kind of think I just fell out of love with the game a little bit and then I started working with my dad who's a pipe fitter welder and he always said to me, listen, you need to like you can work with me for as long as you want, but you need to find something that you really love and enjoy. And we were just driving home one day and he said, listen, you're pretty small. Why don't you just try and be a jockey? And I, I laughed at him. I said, no, yeah, you, you have to be able to ride. And I'd never ridden a race. <laughs> I'd never ridden a horse, never ridden a pony at a riding club, nothing. Wow. So I just typed it in and BRS came up, the racing score in Newmarket. And I thought, well, I'll give it a go. Went for an interview um, and then got on the course and never really looked back. Wow. So really, you got to, it's your dad you got to thank for all of this then? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I wouldn't have even, it wouldn't have even crossed my mind. I had no interest in horse racing, never really watched it. Watched the Grand National and the big races in Cheltenham, like if it was on, but yeah, not from a racing family or a horsey family at all. Did, did he mention that not just because of your height, but was he a racing man? Has he enjoyed horse racing himself? Not really. He's a bit like how I would have been, you know, if the racing was on, he'd watch it. Probably okay. Channel 4 back then. But yeah, no, um, no, not at all. And um, Well, the rest is history, as they say. Um, look, you're obviously a big part of the Mick Appleby team, but you ride for other trainers, including Amy Murphy. Can you give listeners an insight into a day in the life of Freddie Larson? So... Do you ride out regularly for other trainers apart from Mick? Yeah, um, I'd split my time between Amy and Mick mostly. If someone else wants me to gallop, oh, um, I can always take a day off and go and gallop for whoever. But say like uh, tomorrow, I'm going into Amy Murphy, so I'd wake up half five, get in the car, drive to Newmarket, ride sort of three, four lots for Amy, and then either come home or go racing and. Uh, with a good bit of sweating in between uh, most days. Um, do you struggle with the weight? You know, it's a, it's a question we ask jockeys a lot. Some do more than others. Is it difficult for you? It wouldn't be difficult for me, but I think with anyone, you're always trying to do two pound under what you should be doing. So sure. you're taking rides at eight, five when really you should be taking rides at eight, seven, but it doesn't matter if you're heavy or if you're light, everyone wants to be, riding and whether that means you have to lose a couple of pounds then then that's just you know the nature of the job but i just think everyone's always trying to ride two pound under what they should be riding at and your biggest win to date freddie was on pride of america for amy murphy in the john smith's cup at york i was there that day uh not only was it memorable for the way amy leapt into the arms of owner anush don when the photo finish was announced but a huge day for you, you know, big win on a Saturday. Um, did you think you'd won? And how important was the win for the career of Freddie Larson? In all honesty, the race didn't go how we would have liked. You know, you know how much of a what, key front runner another he is. Another race didn't go quite Another right. one. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it was another winner. But um, <laughs> listen, it, they, they very rarely go plan A and he just couldn't go early. And he just had to take, like, I just had to take my time with him, got him rolling in this straight. I thought I'd probably got there too soon, and I was just idling in front. Um, but he'd see out a mile and a quarter really, really well. At the line, I would have said Tom Eves had come and beat me on Astro King. Um, just because I think when you're the one up there being shot at, I think you always you're always thinking the worst. And it was close, um, but no, I think just when it re- when it gets announced, um, I just think just relief that that he did win. That was the biggest thing I think you can see on the replay. I think just utter relief because I knew how much work everyone at home, especially Amy herself and um, Lemos, they put into that horse. You know, sometimes they're walking on eggshells around him because they just have to look after his legs and. And, you know, I know how much time and effort he takes to train and for him to go and produce after an already fantastic season. Yeah, I think I just knew how much it meant to everyone, giving Amy her biggest winner, a domestic winner. And no, no, I was just delighted. How, how important was it to you to get those, you know, that Saturday win, a big win like that? Yeah, I think any jockey knows or likes to believe that they're good enough to produce on the big day. But I think it's just getting your name out there that if someone does give you the opportunity that you you can produce on the big stage and you know handicaps don't really come much bigger than the John Smith's Cup so no I think it just put my name out there more um just elevated my career and you know I had a good stint after that where me and my agent you know he was picking me up really good rides um he got me a great ride in the Air Gold Cup unfortunately the ground went and he actually won yesterday probe um, but, you know, I was picking up really, really good Saturday rides from then on, which is, you know, never, it's, it's never going to be a bad thing. So you, you, you mentioned about the John Smith's Cup being a, a very, you know, historic race. I think the first running of that was the year I was born. And that's a few years ago. <laughs> no, and it's, you know, it is, it is historic and, you know, the trophy and everything. So, no, no, it was brilliant. And I think it just kind of elevate, 
elevated my career that just to show everyone that I could do it if I got the opportunity on the big day. Simon, it's totally unfair to ask Freddie about things that happened on the day you were born because <laughs> obviously you're a dinosaur and he's far from that. But uh, So I'm going to change the subject. Obviously, the uh, celebration you were talking about that Amy, Amy had after the John Smith's Cup at York, uh, Freddie, Simon and I were talking about the Breeders' Cup uh, earlier on and the celebrations in the Mick Appleby Yard when Big Evs won there. And yes, Simon tells me you've you've played a big part in his career and you were singing his praises at the beginning of the season. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Big Evs. <laughs> He's been an absolute superstar for us. And I think I've ridden him pretty much every day, bar when I was on holiday. I think I've ridden him every day since he was at Mix. And he was very raw when he came. Um, he didn't know his own ability. He didn't know that it was, you know the speed that he he possessed. But I remember telling Amy, and I, I'm pretty sure I told everyone I know. <laughs> I said, "This is the best <laughs> horse I've I've ever ridden," and everyone gets excited about. There'll be, you know, it won't be long now. There'll be sort of two or three months time, and everyone will be telling you that they've got the next fastest thing and the next Derby Hope. And I knew how good he was, and I'm just delighted that he showed the world how good he is. And, you know, he's taken a lot of work to get there where he's got to now. But, you know, he's probably made himself a stallion career already off the back of off the back of this year. And anything he can do next year, you know, is a bonus, a bonus for his page anyway. Can I just come back in here? Because in the celebrations after Pride of America's after Pride of America's win at York, I was at, in the bar. Uh, for, to be fair, listeners, Freddie didn't have another ride, so he was allowed a drink. And we were we were chatting, and he was talking about Big Evs, and he said, yeah, that'll go and win the Molcom and then a Breeders' Cup. Yeah, I did. And I I tell you what, the only the only time I ever questioned myself was when Tom Marquand rode him and wanted him in the Flying Childers. And he came back in and he said, I said, that'll win the Breeders' Cup, that, won't it? And he said, I think it should go for the Abbey. When you've got someone like that telling you that we've gone for the wrong race, and I was just, I just half questioned myself. The moment I knew that he'd win the Breeders' Cup is when Tom came to ride him on the turf at Santa Anita. He got back off of him and he looked at me. He didn't say anything. It was like a kid at Christmas. And I just said, I told you he's good on fast ground. And he just, and he just stood there shaking his head. And I think he knew how good he was after that. So whereabouts did you watch the race from and what were the celebrations like for you there, Freddie? Um, I watched it pretty much at the... It's obviously difficult to watch because obviously the, the, the dirt separates the separates you from the turf. But we were just stood right in the winner's enclosure, actually, through everyone's dismay. All the stewards there were trying to get us out, but there was nowhere else to watch. It was so hard with so many people there trying to watch. So we watched on the big screen. And when he came around the bend on the wrong lead, I thought, no, no, no. I was worried for him then. And once Tom kind of picked him up, changed his leads for him, ah, listen, there's only one winner. We know how well he sees out the five. And no, it was brilliant. And I think there was a lot of emotion when I was jumping all over Mick. I think there's a lot of emotion because we'd put so much work into him and for him to go and destroy the best sprinters in the world was just, you know, it was special. It was one of those times where you won't see a two-year-old that fast for a, and handle any ground like he has. You, I, I don't, I don't think you'll see. I don't think you've seen one in the last decade, and I don't think you'll see one for a very long time. I think he's very special. It's starting to sound to me like you might want to be a champion trainer in the future. Do you, I mean, I'm sure you want to be champion jockey first. Are these sort of targets you've set yourself or, or um, what else is it that you're uh, aiming for in the next year or, or longer term? Um, probably short term plans for me. Obviously, I haven't got many winners left of my claim now. So hopefully ride that out this winter. Just keep kicking on. Hopefully Amy has some real nice. Obviously, I've seen the yearlings and help them break them and listen she looks like she has some really nice types but very early to tell yet but hopefully they all come to hand nicely and now hopefully just have another good year make some more contacts and it's just one of those I think longer term I really like working with younger horses and one day I'd love to have my own yard breaking and pre-training um yearlings so um that'd be that's a dream for me 
great stuff. And talking about the horses that you know you're looking forward to the yearlings, is there any particular horses you're really looking forward to getting back on board next season? There's a few. Uh, obviously, Pride of America. When I was out in Santa Anita, I missed missed the ride on him when he finished second, a great second in the listed race at Newmarket. I think he's still got so much untapped potential. I think I can't see him not winning in a listed race next year. For him to run the way he did at Newmarket, a track that I don't think really would suit him and only get beaten and neck was a huge performance. So hopefully he comes back from his break really, really well. Um, another horse I'm really looking forward to riding during the winter, a horse called Billy Joe. I won him first time out. He he overcame greenness to win first time out. He took just another few runs to find his feet on the grass, but I think he's got untapped potential um, back on the all weather. He was really unlucky at Chelmsford the other day. I think I think he's got a good bit in hand, and hopefully he could become, you know, a good heritage handicap sprinter, seven furlong horse. So no, really looking forward to him and a horse that I'm actually gutted about. He'd gone at the sales, a horse called Painter's Palette. He's gone to Australia now. He was, he was bought for a lot of money at Tats. And, you know, I wish him the best as well. I just wanted to give him a little mention because the feel he gave me this year, you know, he is he's also a special, special horse. Freddie, just, just before we come to the final question, you mentioned yearlings there up at Amy's. Have you seen the two that I bought at all, one by Massar and one by Mahatha? I don't know if you've seen them or ridden them yet. I saw the Mahatha, looks a lovely little stamp of a horse, should take plenty of growing into himself. I, I think they're, they're definitely in the right hands with Lemos and Amy, you know, two-year-old specialists. And hopefully, hopefully they'll be up and running next year and, you know, hopefully they can go on and, and win some races for everyone, hopefully with me on board. <laughs> well, that's good to know that I haven't wasted my money on those yearlings. Good stuff. Now, finally, a question we like to ask all of our guests if you could change anything in British racing for the good of British racing, what would it be? I think the first one for me would just be the BHA, the governing body, have to take more note of what the shareholders want. If there's no shareholders, racing wouldn't exist. You know, everyone, it has to benefit everyone. And at the moment, I think there's so many problems not just in in a jockey's view, yeah, there's always going to be problems because we always want things changing and keeping with the times. But I think there's a lot of educated people, uneducated on the sh- subject at hand, making decisions without really considering the people that are going to have to deal with the complications of the decisions they're making, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there has to be there has to be more communication between the two. I don't think decisions should be made based like solely on the BHA's choice. You know, I don't think it makes any sense. Are you talking about sort of communication between the BHA and other interested parties like owners, race courses, trainers? Is that is that where you're coming from? A hundred percent, yeah. That's exactly it. And is there anything else you'd like to suggest? Prize money has to increase has to and it's okay putting on the sort of i don't want to sound horrible but the fads like the sunday series like the racing league i don't understand how this money can be spent for one series whereas it would benefit everyone more if the money went in across the board and like i was just saying to you there off air if you pay £20,000 for a horse and you're running around Wolverhampton for £3,200 to the winner and then you've got to pay training fees on, on top of that, it's it's not financially viable unless you have an endless pot of money. And whether that's, whether that's with the bookies putting in more and like with affordability checks now as well, I don't think there's going to be more people going on to the black market to 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 back horses that means less money coming into racing and you know racing cannot could not take another dive in prize money because it's not benefiting anyone you cannot like these are businesses that everyone's running and you cannot run a business without any funds well said well said freddie 
And thanks for mentioning affordability checks, because that's something Phil and I discussed earlier on in the podcast, and indeed is something we've mentioned in previous episodes. So thanks for giving that a mention. And thank you for coming on Inside the Rails, and, and good luck next year. Thanks very much, guys. No, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Well, another great guest, Phil, wasn't he, Freddie? I know him quite well. He's ridden for me a few times, and he's always entertaining at the race course. He's got a good sense of humour. He's not just humorous, but a very thoughtful and incisive young man. Yeah, he certainly is. And um, yeah, obviously, he's had a, a great time of it recently. I'm sure we're all jealous of the fact that he got to go to the Breeders' Cup and we didn't. So yeah, it was great to hear the stories about that. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of podcast, uh, this one will be out on the 1st of December, as I'm sure people will have realised from downloading it. And we're out on the 1st of the month every month. So there will be another one out on the 1st of January. And if in the meantime, you can help support us by telling your friends all about Inside the Rails, following the podcast on your chosen podcast platform, and just generally retweeting our tweets or engaging with us on Twitter. That would all be brilliant. It all helps us to grow our following. Well, that just leaves me to thank co-host Phil Boyle from BG Racing, producer Callum Ronan from Callum Ronan Creative, special guest jockey Freddie Larson, and of course, you, the listeners. The Brits and the Irish dominated the turf races at the Breeders' Cup, but as autumn falls into winter, it's time for the jump season to really hit top gear as all roads lead to Cheltenham and Aintree and Punchestown. Top class jumps racing isn't a one trick pony. This is Simon Double from Solaria Racing saying thank you for listening to Inside the Rails and wherever you are this festive season, we wish you a happy and peaceful Christmas. Goodbye. <laughs>